All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to FFG Live. My name is Evan Johnson, and I'm joined here today by a motley crew of developers and uh, and uh, story specialists from FFG. So we're here today uh, to do a stream that is a little bit different than streams that we have done in the past. So whereas many of our streams are tied directly to a product, we're talking about a new expansion, we're showing off new cards or, or, uh, or miniatures or what have you. Uh, so in this stream, we're gonna get a little bit more into the lore uh, behind one of our universes. So specifically looking at Arkham Horror and within the Arkham Horror Files universe, uh, taking a look at the city of Innsmouth. So this is featured in a number of um, products and expansions that we have coming up. We've got the Under Dark Waves expansion, for Arkham Horror Third Edition, we've got Bill Henry here from that side. We've got the Innsmouth Conspiracy uh, from Arkham Horror: The Card Game. Matt Newman here to speak to that, and then the Deep Gate novella came out recently. And then Katrina, of course, being our uh, our head of story here at FFG, uh, so she is here to be able to speak to all of that. Uh, how's everyone doing today? Good. Hanging in there. It's like the yeah. opposite of Minnesota normally. So it's like we don't actually have snow, which is amazing. Yeah, it's really warm out today. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty uh, groggy out there, actually. <laughs> it's good beach weather. <laughs> Maybe uh, similar to the weather in Innsmouth. Probably not. I think it's kind of like misty there. <laughs> misty, foggy, definitely humid, though. I imagine it's mm. very humid. Oh, yeah, it's wet. It's yeah. kind of like clammy on your skin. <laughs> uh, so I guess let, let, let's get into it in that way. Uh, so Innsmouth, this, this, is, this is not a place that we created, of course. Uh, what, what is the source material for Innsmouth? How did, how did we get here? Uh, yeah. So, go ahead, Matt. No, 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 you go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. I was just going to say, so most of our inspiration for um, all of our Innsmouth material, of course, comes from the Shadow Over Innsmouth novella, um, which, of course, focuses on Innsmouth. It's not the first time that um, the, the mythos, um, the Lovecraftian mythos, introduces some of the ancient ones like Dagon and Hydra. Those have kind of had kind of been hinted at before, but I believe it's the first time that we visit Innsmouth in detail. Um, from the point of view of someone who is trying to learn more about their family and things don't quite go well for them, suffice it to say. Yeah, 
Yeah, I think uh, Lovecraft often scattered references to his other works in, in each of them. So it might not be the first time Innsmouth is mentioned, but it's definitely the first time that we go there in the POV of a protagonist and actually see what Innsmouth is like in person. Yeah. So speaking to that, like what, what does Innsmouth mean to each of you specifically? Like, is there a specific image or a, or a moment that, that springs to mind when you hear Innsmouth? Um, for me, I always kind of pictured this sort of decrepit, rundown, disheveled uh, kind of harbor town um, that you, you think you know what you're getting into when you arrive. And the more you stay, the longer you stay there, the more you realize that there's a lot more going on behind the scenes than just what you see. And uh, that, that sort of thing. That's, to me, that's, that's like, the, the mystery of Innsmouth is is hidden, is shrouded behind what you see when you first arrive. Yeah, that idea of just kind of creeping decay, mm -hmm. that, just kind of an infectious grossness. Yeah, that just yeah. permeates everything. Like it's not just that it's disheveled; it's like it's it's, it's it feels rotten almost. You Have know. you smelled a beach at low tide? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Innsmouth has a smell, for sure. <laughs> um, for me, Innsmouth is very reminiscent of the coastal Massachusetts towns um, that I had visited growing up. So for me, um, my parents would actually take my family out to Cape Cod every summer because um, I grew up in the Northeast. And so I got to see a whole bunch of like these fishing towns, like fishing is still a big thing on the East Coast, especially, um, you know, out by the, the Atlantic. So for me, like I have all these images of like the tidal marshes and like these like long stretches of beach and like these really cool like inlets, the, the coast is really like jagged and, you know, there's like some promontories and, and some coves and things like that. But like, when I think of Innsmouth, all of those memories are sort of overlaid with this like mist, kind of like you were talking about before. Um, and particularly like, you can get some spectacular views of the ocean with the storms rolling in. And I think of like, that really like foreboding sort of dark horizon, um, mm -hmm. kind of leading out to Devil Reef, which is one of the uh, really storied and like terrifying parts of Innsmouth that no regular traveler gets to see. Yeah. Yeah. I, I grew up on Long Island, so it's not it's not the same, but definitely like some of those northern uh, like uh, on the Long Island Sound, some of those like northern Long Island towns have that that same kind of foggy mist that rolls in in the morning when you wake up and you go outside and you can't see more than like ten feet in front of you. Yeah. <laughs> Actual foghorns. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> the, beach, the beach isn't a beach. Like there's no sand. It's just rocks. <laughs> in the in the Twitch chat here, Great Old Ones Gaming says that Innsmouth is supposedly a dark take on Newburyport and Plum Island specifically. I have heard that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I haven't been north to Newburyport. The furthest up I've gone is Salem, which of course is the inspiration for Arkham. So mm -hmm. Yeah. I bet it's, uh, I think there's a, a river there in Newburyport that might be the Man Exit, which is referenced in, in Innsmouth. So it's like Innsmouth gets to be, it's, it's a harbor town, but it also has all this like marshy area that kind of cuts it off from the rest of civilization. Yeah, it's all like salt marshes. That, that's super interesting and, and such a, a weird thing that's kind of unique to Lovecraft where he wove kind of his own fictional towns and, and, and regions into Massachusetts and the New England area so that you do get like these places where like, wait, that's like, that's a real river or that's like, that's an actual town here. And, you know, he's just kind of spliced his own stuff in in a very interesting way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so Kat, as the, as the creative director of story and setting, um, what uh, are the Arkham Horror Files investigators that really kind of have a tie to Innsmouth? Like, who could people expect to see or, or encounter or play as uh, when, when Innsmouth is at the table? 
Yeah, so one of the investigators that doesn't immediately come top of mind, but if you start to read into her backstory, you'll see the link pretty clearly. Um, Amanda Sharp is the student. Um, she's appeared in a number of our um, games, and although she's, you might associate her primarily with Miskatonic University, for her, she's plagued by these nightmares, which is like a similar theme that we see for many characters um, who hail from Innsmouth or who have relations with the Marsh family. And for her, she becomes almost like transfixed or drawn into these paintings of oceans where she sees them on Miskatonic campus. And when she dreams, it's of this underwater city um, that she doesn't quite realize is right off the coast of Innsmouth, in Ahthale, um, the place where the Deep Ones dwell. So some of the games where you play as her, you have to kind of resist that call to the sea and resist the fate of um, transforming into the, the Deep Ones that are the true monsters um, plaguing the Innsmouth area that, that come from Anathale and some of those other, and from the, the depths of the sea. So Amanda Sharp, um, I think a lot of her pictures cast her in like a bluish sort of green underwater um, palette to kind of evoke that, that deep sea feeling. Um, another one who I think was introduced for the first time in the Innsmouth Horror expansion um, for the Arkham Horror board game is Roland Banks, the Fed. And I think he is inspired by Innsmouth because at the very beginning of the story shot over Innsmouth, you hear the narrator relating the fact that, oh, well, the US government has started to raid that town and like pull it apart and, and try to get to the bottom of whatever terrors are happening there. And so Roland Banks is kind of like your chance as an investigator to kind of explore, well, well what happens when the Fed uh, has to deal with something that's well beyond mortal concerns. There's no SOP for dealing with great ones. And Roland is very by the book. So he's kind of confronted to that. You know, what is he supposed to do about gates to other worlds or monsters when confronted with them? So um, I think he is an exploration of the idea of, well, what does the government do when it's confronted with the horrors of the mythos? Um, and in some of our games, we've kind of take that a little bit further and we have, is it the agency? Mm -hmm. That's a, a secret organization um, dedicated to correlating knowledge and sharing what they've learned with each other. So yeah, um, Roland Banks. There's no SOP as far as the Bureau is concerned, but uh, the agency might have something. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and then finally, the really obvious one um, is Silas Marsh, who bears the Marsh family name and who comes from that tradition of sailors and dock workers. And so he is, of course, the sailor. If you play as his investigator, usually he's depicted on a ship and uh, he's very much like he he can't stay still. He's always traveling from one place to another and it's the ocean that calls him back again and again. So we see a familiar theme like we had with Amanda Sharp where he dreams of this place deep below the sea and his his family is pretty tight-lipped about like what their experiences are with the ocean and they don't really wanna talk about it. At least those uh, family members that have been able to get away from Innsmouth and he's, he's kind of wary enough of, of the town, like because it's so decaying and because it has that bad feel that he wants to stay away. But in the course of uh, his investigations, it's an easier thing to say than to do to, to stay away from the thing that's calling for you. I see, um, uh, oh, did, sorry, do you have more? No, just those are the three investigators that I think have the closest ties to Innsmouth directly. I, I see a question from uh, Ham Zardo in the chat. He, he says, I wonder how the coffee is in Innsmouth. So uh, <laughs> what, are, what are your takes on that? Oh, man. I, you know what? I bet that they have good depth charges. Eh? All right. <laughs> yeah, I would say... Uh, espresso that you dunk into uh, black coffee, basically. <laughs> <laughs> 
I would imagine that a lot of sailors kind of have their own personal stash of of coffee. I mean, Innsmouth itself has fallen so far from like the the pinnacle of its history when it like had all of this wealth and it had all of these like good fishing halls and other things like that. But now um, there's a, a small like grocery that the narrator visits in the Innsmouth. Yeah. The um, yeah. Yeah. Um, that we feature in a couple of our games. So there's a, a small place where you might be able to get coffee, but I imagine that most of the people that, um, you know, sail in or out of Innsmouth would have their own, their own brew. <laughs> <laughs> so then on the flip side of protagonists, um, and maybe the, the devs can speak more to on this side. Uh, what what are the antagonists that, that you find while exploring Innsmouth? There are, there are a lot of, um, you know, very kind of iconic elements, uh, but maybe there are some also that are, that are less iconic that, that people can expect to see uh, in these stories. Yeah, they're kind of split into three groups of uh, decreasing humanity as they kind of get farther from the town. So the Marsh family is all over the place. They run the refinery. They run most of the what remains of the establishment in Innsmouth. Um, and at some point in their history, they traded their humanity for money and fish. <laughs> when you're in a fishing town that needs to survive, that is a reasonable, perhaps, kind of Faustian bargain. Uh, Super relatable. So, yeah. <laughs> I remember that one time I traded my humanity. <laughs> hey, you know, sometimes it, it just smells that good and you just eat, <laughs> eat some fish and chips. Uh, so Barnabas Marsh runs the refinery and he's just a real ruthless, not quite human heavy. Like he, the refinery is where they process all their, all the gold they get from the deep ones and then they use that to raise their own power. So it's a, there's a lot of unknown secrets hiding in the refinery and the marshes guard it pretty carefully. And then the family kind of extends from there. Robert Marsh runs the Eternal Order of Dagon, which is kind of our next faction of bad guys in, in Innsmouth. And they're uh, a much darker take on the Masons, kind of a, the, the secret society that outsiders don't get a lot of visibility into, but uh, the eternal order of Dagon is, you know, trying to turn everybody into fish people because they think the oceans are going to rise and only the truly faithful will live. Like, um, yeah, yeah the, right. the esoteric order of Dagon has um, like yeah. several kind of oaths that they they ask their adherence to take and I think it's each of those oaths that kind of initiate them into the greater mysteries which is to say horrors of what lurks beneath yeah the farther into that organization you get the more you more of yourself you give up and the more of the evil of the mythos you take on and then by the time you find out what it's all about it you're probably in too deep to really escape in too deep <laughs> I wish I could say that was intentional. <laughs> and then the the last and probably most obvious group are the deep ones themselves. Scary fish people that live in the water and then come out of the water and eat your family. Uh, and they're ruled over by Mother Hydra and Father Dagon, the, the two big bads. They're not... They usually, we like usually depict them as they're just really big deep ones. They're not truly ancient ones. They're just, I, I think deep ones are like lobsters. They don't have a natural lifespan. They just keep growing and getting bigger and bigger. Wait, and lobsters really, don't stop growing? Yeah, lobsters have no natural lifespan. <laughs> they, just, they just grow until they literally cannot eat enough food to support their bodies. We just blew cat nine. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know that. I mean, I've seen some pretty big horseshoe crabs, but I didn't know that about lobsters. Yeah. Oceans are kind of terrifying. Only kind of? They're just uh, so weird, so different from what we know. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, we sort of classify Dagon and Hydra as being ancient ones for the sake of simplicity, but they don't really, they're not on the same level as like Yog Sothoth, where they're like mythic right. deities uh, or embodiments of concepts or anything like that. Um, they really are just uh, enormous deep one leaders, mm -hmm. you might say. Um, would you um, would you like extrapolate that same line out to Cthulhu, where he is just like an enormous deep one, or do you think, or is he something something higher? No, uh, Cthulhu is definitely something higher. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I really like Phil's analogy of like the lobster. It's just like they keep growing, and like now I'm like thinking about what Mother Hydra and Father Dagon eat in order to sustain themselves. I'm sure it's not good. Yeah. Um, pretty much anything and a lot of it. <laughs> right. <you see>. Yeah. <laughs> anything and a lot of it. Yeah. If you're a fish in the ocean and you're in like the deep and you're near where deep ones live, it's not a good time because you're probably getting eaten. <laughs> yeah. Or I would joining bet their kind. Of eating their smaller deep ones too. Oh. If they need food, they just sing their song and mind control their brethren and you're just swimming right into their mouths. Yep. <laughs> just and mass <laughs> it uh it sure is a good thing that the uh the marshes struck that deal for unlimited fish to make this a perfect space <laughs> for deep ones well not to mention the favor of the deep ones and you don't want them on your bad side am i right yeah really the good guys yeah that's actually one place that we've kind of taken some liberties with the source material and made changes mm -hmm. um for those of you who have read the original story um, the source of the Innsmouth look and the curse afflicting the town, they they come from those jewelry pieces, from the, that gold that um, Obed Marsh brings back with him. And it's rumored that he brought back like a wife as well, who's like the source of all of the these like mutations or corruptions that are within the family. Um, certainly the, the narrator and his, his ally, the town drunk, Zadok like describe that with horror um, in the in the original story, but it kind of gets into dangerous territory because the implication from that story is that associating with foreign peoples will introduce horrors in your town, and like we really wanted to stay away from that just because the the racist overtones um, of that particular aspect of the story really don't have a place in our games. Um, and so we've made some changes to the, or to the origin of the Innsmouth Deep Ones in Arkham Horror so that um, the horror comes from what lurks in the darkness in the sea, um, not from Lovecraft's racist ideas about other cultures and people. It is a 100-year-old so -old story, and it does exist within the context, so it's something that we're mindful of um, when we're portraying like, the source of the Deep, the, the source of the deep One corruption in, in our stories, like, which, saying, like Phil was that saying, the that that Order of Dagon, which is like a mandatory religion for everyone, religion in, for everyone in the city, like city, who knows like sorts of who knows what sorts of water baptisms, water baptism and, and kind of heaven and inside the walls and those walls um, and um, so we we just kind of we're, we're we just a little bit kind of different in a little bit of a different direction with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. for sure. Yeah, uh, it sounds like we've got uh, it sounds like we've got a bit of sound. the coming through on the mics. Um, is it? And ask in the chat, is this everyone's uh, mic or only cats that's being affected? Oh, I can't hear it. So if it's mine, I can mute when I'm not talking. Okay, it's everyone. All right, so we, we have our, our guy, Ryan Thompson, working on this behind the scenes. Um, are we still understandable? Uh, I would believe so, since people are responding. <laughs> But, uh, so does it just sound like we're underwater? Is it like we have a Facebook filter on and it's like you got the pool and the ducky and... Yep, okay. They were saying that we're understandable. It sounds like kind of robotic reverb or like we're underwater. Uh, so we're, we're just going to kind of roll with it and keep going and uh, enjoy this extra steamy, theming, I suppose. <laughs> um, I saw a question further up about... Um, Okay, it looks like it's been fixed now. Uh, a question further up about how we differentiate between the esoteric order of Dagon and other cults, right? Uh, like what makes them different than random cult number A? <laughs> and, and I think uh, 
Phil and Kat can speak to this in, in their own way if they want. But to me, uh, it's always been the way that it, they they take that that power that they have and they extend it throughout all of Innsmouth. They they really run the town. Um, they've kind of got their roots all throughout uh, the like the government, the economy. Every part of Innsmouth is traced back to this this organization. Um, and that's would very, you say that it's conspiratorial? You might, yeah, you might <laughs> call it a conspiracy if you were, you know, let's say, uh, investigating it. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's definitely, it's different from like, if you say like the Silver Twilight Lodge, well, they kind of also have their roots all throughout Arkham, but they're very secretive and they're very like covert. Uh, and it takes a lot of um, investigating to even know what they do at all. Whereas the Esoteric Order of Dagon is kind of everywhere in, in Innsmouth. Um, at least that's that's my that's been my takeaway. Yeah, it, it certainly shares some roots with um, some of the other orders, but I think what's kind of interesting, I mean, the Silver Twilight Lodge does this as well, but it's like the on its face or on the surface, you know, it just kind of seems like it's its own secret society. Like there are other orders besides the the Masons um, and other like historical groups like that. They're just kind of like social clubs with, um, you know, a little bit more to it, a little bit of ceremony. But um, I think the Esoteric Order of Dagon is unique in that it's really like just in Innsmouth and it's very centered around like that, that town's history. And I do think that it has something to do with the number of deep ones in the town. And mm -hmm. part of why uh, our investigators like Amanda Sharp and, and Silas Marsh are trying to like stay away is because they don't want to be inducted into that order. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think a lot of other cults that, that we've uh, had in the Arkham Files IP are a lot more secretive and a lot more uh, like a lot lesser in number in terms of like how many people are in their order or whatever. It's not like an entire town or anything. It's just going to be like a group of people like-minded with possible arcane powers or um, yeah. uh, some 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 deity that they pray to that gives them power or something. Yeah. And they've got some artifacts that they use too, right? I don't know if those have been spoiled. Yeah, I don't know what's out there already. Who knows? <laughs> uh, a it's question. Oh, go for know, it. It's a more mystic means of spreading the corruption, and they use the things they they got from the deep ones to and the and those artifacts, those three or four secret things that Cat mentioned to, <laughs> to spread that that uh, deep one infection. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Warlock Alex is asking if there are any named figures who represent the Esoteric Order of Dagon. Uh, Robert Marsh, I think, in our IP is that is the head of that organization. And there, there may be other, uh, yeah. other uh, figures that show up. Members of the Marsh family. Family. Uh, the Marsh family is a big family, um, mm -hmm. and a lot of the ones that are in Innsmouth are sort of in on it. Um, so there may be other ones that show up as well. Yeah, I don't know that we name any particular members in um, the Deep Gate at all. I think the Esoteric Order plays a very minor role in that story. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The Esoteric Order is definitely all over the internet conspiracy, but I'm uh, I'm gonna not name names because who knows? Who knows who's a member? <laughs> Oh, oh no! <laughs> uh, a question here that that's interesting, and and don't answer this if it might be a spoiler <laughs> to something. Um, but uh, what is Robert Marsh's relationship to Silas? Oh, I don't know that we've defined that. I don't. I don't think we say. Yeah, yes. the Marsh family's really big. It's not like they're first cousins or anything, but they're they're on the same tree. Maybe a couple branches apart. There's a, a character in the Deep Gate that Silas Marsh goes to for help initially. I think it's Martin Marsh. Um, they they get coffee in the middle of a nor'easter in the Arkham docks, and 
you know, Silas tries unsuccessfully to find out, you know, is there anything like weird about our family that like I didn't quite pick up on at all? And he's like, you shouldn't ask that question. Don't ask me that question. Move along. It's always a good sign. Everything's fine here. <laughs> Silas seems like he might have a bit of a, a low observation score if he's uh, asking those sorts of questions. Which is not great if you're like a sailor. They haven't read his own eye. They don't know. Oh, that's true. He has an eye patch in a lot of his pictures. Uh, uh, so a question about kind of the, the general themes here. So what are some of the themes for each of you that really make a story feel like it's set in Innsmouth? What kind of makes it scary and cool and sets it apart from Arkham or Kingsport or, or wherever? To me, the thing about Innsmouth that's always been scary is this sort of, it's like this fear that you get when you walk into a place and everyone immediately turns and looks at you and, and like gives you the side eye and you kind of feel like you're not in on it, like you're not wanted, like you're an outsider and everyone has a secret that they're not telling you. You don't know what it is. Um, and like, I, I'm sure probably everyone's had that feeling at least once in their life and it probably was nothing. It was probably just this weird primal fear in the back of their head. Um, mm -hmm. but it's like walking into like the school library and everyone just kind of gives you a look and you're like, did I interrupt something? Like what, what is happening? You know, that sort of thing. Um, but you take that feeling and you multiply it by like a thousand because it's real and everyone in Innsmouth is in on this, this, uh, this organization and they don't want you here. They don't want you digging through their secrets. You know what I mean? Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of drawn in by the, the idea of that invisible corruption that mm -hmm. might, you might already be part of it and you don't know. And just the, the, the moment of awakening we see in, in the original story or in some of the, I don't know if we should worry about spoiling a uh, hundred year old novella. No, um, we should. No. <laughs> uh, the idea that like you're, you're digging for the truth and then you, it's so much worse than you realized you're part of this thing and you didn't even know that those sinister forces had already taken you. Right. And now you have to come to grips with, with, uh, with this revelation. Mm -hmm. um, at least that's that's very much uh, the the moment of horror in the original story for sure. So for me, there's two themes that really stick out as feeling very Innsmouth to me. Um, the first one is isolation, just because oh, yeah. like it's so remote, mm -hmm. and like one of the things that kind of you know, creeps me out when I'm on a boat or something is like, you're out there, like you're kind of on your own. Like sure, there's like conventions to like have, you know, other boaters help you if you're in distress, but like if you need help, you have to hope that there's someone close enough to you that can provide aid and like both in the story, Shadow Over Innsmouth um, and in the Deep Gate novella, um, that sort of isolation of like having very few people that you can turn to for help. <laughs> Um, really kind of makes you feel like a drift. Um, one of the inspirations I think too for, for Innsmouth includes um, like the, the whaling disaster of the ship um, Essex, which is another sort of horrifying thing where it's like you're stuck on a boat after your ship uh, gets rammed by a whale and you've got nothing but like maybe a couple other people to like sail with you to another like to safety and it's just like that's scary that's 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 what the horror comes from um the second theme that i really see with insmith and we talked about it a little bit before is like that sense of decay of rot and like i think about like what you'll find while walking down a beach like you'll find like dead horseshoe crabs with like their like really creepy like shells of like pieces of it um, and sometimes you can't even identify what's been washed up on shore. And I think that's where we get a lot of our great like sea creature mythology is like, what are these bones? Like they don't look like anything natural like to this earth. Um, and Innsmouth also in the way that it's described, it's like a rotting city. Like it's, it's commerce, it's wealth is pretty dried up. People are 
mostly leaving the town and not coming back. And it's like that corruption that we talked about where it's like rotting from within. Um, even in the Deepgate novella, there's um, a discussion of how the, the harbor for Innsmouth used to be much more prosperous, but that too has like silted in and there's like the size of the ships that can even come and go um, has been dramatically reduced. So it's just slowly the same way that like the tide will like slowly eat away at a sandbar or slowly eat away at yeah. the at the um, cliff side, you kind of have that feeling. So that and add anything nautical that you want and you've got Innsmouth horror. Yeah. Yeah. The Deepgate also has this great description of the, the old ship graveyard, mm. all these decommissioned ships from the war and things like that, and just these rotting hulks out in the out in the harbor. It's just real creepy. <laughs> Luckily, some of those mines still work. Yeah, right. Maybe. <laughs> yeah. For me, I'm also, I'm highly thalassophobic, which is like fear of the deep ocean and um, anything that may be in said ocean. <laughs> Uh, like, I, I honestly, I can't even play, like, a single video game where you swim. I'm just out. I, like, I can't do it. So uh, I kind of wanted to channel some of that fear into uh, what you'll be experiencing. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I always, I always picture it as, like, you know, it's like seeing, like, a dead fish washed up on the beach, you know, where it still looks just like a fish right but it stinks you know or like picking up a piece of drift wood that looks solid and then it just like crumbles to rot in your hand mm -hmm. you know um the metaphor so, down. <laughs> yeah <laughs> so to get into kind of like the the individual products a little bit uh cat you want to tell us a little bit more about the deep gate and kind of the the specific take on insmith in that game or in that yeah book. i'm sorry uh, so it's a great beach read, <laughs> I would say. Um, so one thing that's awesome, um, the author, Chris A. Jackson, uh, he actually lives on a sailboat for half the year. And like, so he's a fantastic author of um, not just The Deep Gate, but many other stories as well, um, many of which have nautical themes. But it's like, I knew that he would be perfect for writing the Silas Marsh novella, because Silas, of course, is a... a um, main character of this story um, because Jackson would really know um, what it's like to be on a boat. He would know what it's like to kind of try to sail something and, and understand how the tides and, and of course, knowing all of the jargon that's related to, um, to ships and so forth. So it was like, we really, the, the scheduling worked out perfectly and, and it was a fantastic chance to be able to use his talents on a, an Arkham Horror book. Um, but this this novella describes Silas's like first foray into the mythos, where he's paired up with the very unlikely ally of Abigail Foreman, who lives most of her life in the Orne Library at Miskatonic University. But she has a tome from the 1500s called the Prophecy Profana, whose names on the page keep changing, um, and she she shows it to. Uh, Norman Withers, who of course is our um, astronomer investigator. He's like, well, this is like some sort of celestial navigation. Like this has to do with seafaring. So as fate would have it, she runs into Silas Marsh um, who recognizes what these numbers mean and, and how to decipher them. And at first he wants to, to say no and, and you know to not help her like this is crazy. Someone's just pulling a prank on her. Um, but in the periphery of the pages, he sees the same creatures that haunt his nightmares, these like underwater beings. And so he realizes that he has to help Abigail Foreman and together they realize um, that this book is pointing to Devil Reef. The, the, uh, the math is kind of pointing them in that direction. The time of the apocalypse keeps changing. That's that's described in this book, but not the place. So it's Silas Marsh finally being forced to, to confront his family in Innsmouth and in particular what what is dwelling like deep below Devil Reef. And um, I think it's a great summer read just because you've got um, boat chases, 
diving bells, sunken shipwrecks, there's mines, there's harpoons, like what more could you ask for? So you can, uh, I think we still have some in stock right now so you can pick it up and we've also got it on DriveThruRPG slash DriveThruFiction and on Amazon as an ebook. So um, if, you, if you really wanna dig into some uh, Innsmouth flavored fiction, I'd highly recommend uh, Chris A. Jackson's The Deep Gate. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, so then, Phil, with the upcoming Under Dark Waves expansion for Arkham Horror Third Edition, how are we tackling Innsmouth in that box? Yeah, I, I jokingly referred to this box early in its development as Arkham Goes Hawaiian because it was our our first chance to to leave the city of Arkham and go see these other towns, go see Innsmouth and Kingsport. Um, and the things I really wanted to get in there about Innsmouth that I is just how much less safe it is than Arkham. Like Arkham, crazy stuff happens all the time. But in Innsmouth, the whole town is against you. Both the people and the buildings and the, the landscape, everything is arrayed against you in Innsmouth. Um, and then the idea of, hey, so normally there's a big bad in Arkham Horror. Well, this there's two because Dagon and Hydra come as a package deal. And they're both really bad. <laughs> so what does it mean to have to deal with both of them and this town that's trying to kill you and the fact that it's just not that easy to get to? Totally. Uh, and then for Matt, with the Innsmouth conspiracy, yeah. what, uh, how, how does Innsmouth apply to Arkham or the card game? Yeah, so for the Innsmouth Conspiracy, uh, I mean, it's kind of right there in the title, right? We, we kind of touched upon it earlier, but I really wanted to get across this feeling of mystery that Innsmouth has a lot more going on behind the scenes than what we see. And, um, and it's not just the residents of Innsmouth, too. It's, 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 it's you and it's, the, it's all these factions um, coming together and trying to, uh, you trying to piece together the pieces of the puzzle, which... Uh, I mean, Arkham Horror is always a game about solving arcane mysteries, and uh, but I think this is the first one of the first expansions we've done where, really, you the player have no idea what's going on either until you start playing and delving into the mystery yourself. Um, and one of the ways in which we did that is with this this sort of uh, intro, this like in media res introduction where you're just thrown right into the the you're thrust right into the uh, events of the campaign with no memory of anything that's happened. And you have to go back and sort of piece together everything that's happened up to that point. So it sort of captures this feeling of like a thriller mystery movie, um, uh, hopefully, uh, in, in which Innsmouth is like a major character itself. Um, and you're trying to figure out the secrets of the town. Yeah, that's sweet. A uh, quick question from the chat um, for Phil. Uh, it, are there new ancient ones besides De Father Dagon and Mother Hydra coming in under dark waves? There are. Um, so there, are each expan each of the scenarios in the box has a, a different a different threat. Uh, one of them we've seen before <laughs> in in Arkham Third, uh, and then we also have some much larger threats that span the, the entire Miskatonic Valley. So all three towns mm. are under threat there. That's a cool one. That's my favorite one in the box. Yeah, that's that's really exciting. Um, for, for both the for both the devs, were there uh, like, as you are exploring Innsmouth, were there specific game mechanics that you turned to that were really evocative of that setting or um, uh, help to help you convey the story the way that you wanted. Um, so for me, uh, obviously, we already kind of showed off the flood tokens in a previous stream, but that was like a big thing. Um, this idea of uh, the rising tide, and not just how that relates to the town, but to the the area surrounding the town as well, and how you as an investigator would interact with the rising tide, and it could be different from scenario to scenario wherever those tokens show up. Um, that to me, I think, was a, a big draw for Innsmouth. Like, I knew that this was one of the only times we'd get to really explore that sort of mechanic, so I, I wanted to do as much with it as I as we possibly could. Um, the other thing that I think is exciting is if we're going if we're going to be going to Innsmouth, we should probably go on a boat at some point. 
um, <laughs> that was that was exciting too. Uh, I, I I really like this that scenario. Uh, I, I won't go into it more because I don't want to spoil how that scenario works, but it's it's very cool. <laughs> I'm glad you go on a boat. I would be disappointed if yeah, not. I think everyone would be if you go to Innsmouth, you don't get to go on a boat. So yeah. definitely. <laughs> So, uh, Bill, was there something with Underdark Waves that really helped you evoke that? Yeah, I wanted to get into the fact that there are some locations like Devil Reef that are so much more involved and so much more dangerous um, than the kind of the standard locations we see. So, figuring out how to make those those really iconic special locations work differently from from the uh, the existing, the existing structure, and then also the idea of that corruption inside of you, where you're just you're trying your best to do the right thing, but there's just some corrupting influence in you that's making you do the wrong thing. Yeah. And that's in all all four scenarios in the box, not just the the end of one, but the that idea of being tainted by the mythos you're trying to fight. Mm. Definitely. So between the Innsmouth Conspiracy, Under Dark Waves, and the Deep Gate, we spent a lot of time highlighting Innsmouth in our Arkham Horror Files setting. Uh, in each of these, like, are we showing a different side of Innsmouth in each of these products? And with regards to the similarities, how do we keep a coherent vision of the setting across these multiple product lines? For sure, yeah. I mean, the Innsmouth Conspiracy has eight different scenarios, and each scenario is going to explore a different facet of Innsmouth or its surrounding areas. So there's definitely ample opportunity there. Uh, and unlike some previous campaigns that we've done, you know, we don't like start in Arkham and then go to Innsmouth. Pretty much, Innsmouth is the is the focus of that campaign through and through. Um, so there's a lot of opportunity to explore different um, different parts of Innsmouth, whereas. Uh, and I don't want to speak to I don't want to speak over Phil here with the board game, but with the board game, really you get to explore all of Innsmouth right from the get go because it's it's a greater scale. Uh, the Arkham board mm -hmm. game is like you're you're in a whole town. Um, so right off the bat, even just one tile of the board game has an entire neighborhood's worth of stuff inside it. Um, whereas the uh, Arkham Horror card game is a lot more like narrow in scope. So each scenario is going to uh, take you to a different place, essentially. Yeah. Right. Like the, the card game lets you get really in depth into specific locations, and then right. the the board game lets you explore a little more freely, but and see more of what's there without, but at the trade off of not getting that really deep dive into. I was going to name some locations, but I'm not going to spoil it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, like, if you want the, the deepest dive, you need to read The Deep Gate. Uh, <laughs> but I'm sure. uh, because it's, like, personal and, and fiction really, like, allows us to shine as you get to see, like, some of more of the, like, character interactions, and you get to, like, really get into the, the psychology of the characters who are experiencing it, whereas, like, with a game, it's, like, you are the, the protagonist, you're right. um, exploring that, and so it was fun to see, uh, you know, Silas Marsh has some family issues, and they're not the friendliest, you don't really want to go on a picnic with them, maybe yeah. they're trying to kill you. <laughs> Yeah, I was going to say the, the deep gate, you really kind of get the perspective of Innsmouth from Silas, like from Silas's yeah. perspective. Whereas with the board game and the card game, you're, you're kind of getting the perspective of, uh, of well, your own perspective, really, because you're kind of stepping into the shoes of whatever investigator you're playing, which may or may not be anyone tied to Innsmouth. Um, anyone. <laughs> yeah. I'm imagining Safina going to Innsmouth to paint beautiful landscapes. Sure. Well, yeah, I mean, paint landscapes. I don't know about beautiful. <laughs> he just stepped off the bus and goes, Ew. <laughs> yeah, uh, should we also mention uh, mansions? Yeah. yeah. It's been a while since I've played those scenarios, but I yeah, think yeah. There's, there's two. There's two intimate scenarios in, uh, in Mansions of Madness uh, in the core box. Uh, we, I don't think there was ever like an Innsmouth focused expansion, but there, right off the bat, you have two uh, uh, Escape from Innsmouth and Rising Tide. 
Um, and both of those focus on a sort of different facet of Innsmouth as well. Escape from uh, Innsmouth kind of recreates the classic escape from the hotel part of the original Shadow Over Innsmouth story. And uh, Rising Tide is a more sort of in-depth uh, look at Innsmouth where you're trying to kind of figure out what's going on and there's different characters and some of them are cultists and some of them aren't. You have to figure that out and it's different every time. And I think there's a fabulous scenario in the Horrific Journeys expansion where like there's a trader mechanic, right? Where you could actually become a deep one as part of the scenario. So that's another expansion to check out if you want some Innsmouth flavored Arkham. And you get to be on a boat. Yes. Yeah. And there's flooding. <laughs> <laughs> it checks all the boxes. Yeah, all the boxes, boat, flooding, Fish. <laughs> yep. Uh, so then, you know, we talked about all these board games, um, but if someone really wants to like dive into this or like, they can't get enough, like are there other uh, influences, you know, books or video games or movies that kind of shape and inform this setting beyond just the HP Lovecraft story? Yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, for me, uh, and a lot of it is cyclical, right? Because um, a, a lot of it all comes back to Shadow Over Innsmouth. Um, but uh, those who know me, I'm a big video gamer. Um, I've played almost every like horror game that that. Uh, uh, well, I, I don't want to say that I played every horror game, but I've played a lot of horror games. <laughs> um, and uh, the ones that stick out to me are uh, Dark Corners of the Earth, which is a Call of Cthulhu themed uh, game that's also set in Innsmouth. That was a game I played when I was uh, pretty young, and it kind of stuck with me for a long time after that. And uh, also recreates a lot of those same classic scenes from Shadow Over Innsmouth. Um, and then the other one that comes to mind is Bloodborne. Bloodborne has a setting inside it that is, yeah, <laughs> giving me the thumbs up, that's very much uh, inspired by Innsmouth. But it's not really Innsmouth, it's like sort of Innsmouth uh, adjacent. Um, it's a lot more horrific uh, on its face. And, um, but it captures that sense of decay and decrepitness, I think. That uh, and uh, that sort of like threat from underwater that I think that we like to capture when we depict Innsmouth. So to me, that's like a, a big in, uh, influence uh, on me. So not necessarily an influence, but a movie that I watched recently that ticks like nautical horror boxes, especially if you really like the uh, like the monologuing of like crazy sea captains, um, the lighthouse, um, not for everyone, definitely an intense movie, um, not gory or anything, but not too gory anyway, but uh, definitely that feeling of isolation, the feeling of like the sea being alone as it like surrounds you. I, I highly recommend checking out the lighthouse. Yeah. yeah. Also, you just reminded me, uh, another another game that has influenced the sort of tone, I think, of Innsmouth uh, for me is Silent Hill. Uh, and it stems from that isolation feeling that you're, mm -hmm. that, that loneliness that you were talking about, um, which also kind of relates to the feeling of being an outsider. Like you arrive in this town and even though there's people there, like there, it's not like it's abandoned, you still kind of feel alone. And you're just kind of wandering around and everyone's looking at you like, why are you here? And that, that to me, like Silent Hill captures that really well as well. Plus the fog. Yeah, there are also a lot of anthologies of new mythos fiction mm -hmm. that yeah. touch on a lot of these things really well. Um, uh, she Walks in Shadows is one of my favorite collections of those. There are a couple stories in there that kind of get at the um, the Innsmouth themes that we're, we're talking about here. Yeah, that's on my to read list. I definitely want to check that one out. Yeah, I would, uh, I would throw out uh, a couple that are more like tangentially related, I would say, but, um, there's a movie, a, an excellent movie called Annihilation, um, mm -hmm. that really captures this theme of being changed from within um that uh is sort of prevalent in Innsmouth and uh it has a a very kind of like Cthulhu adjacent sort of tone that is, that is fun um and then a lot earlier in this we touched on 
you know, government agencies getting caught up in things that they don't understand that they're not equipped to deal with. Um, there's a video game called Control that mm -hmm. is excellent. Uh, yeah. and I highly recommend it for, for the theming and, uh, and, and, and that kind of storyline as well. Yeah, I agree wholeheartedly with, with uh, those recommendations, especially Control. Yeah. Oh man, it's so good. It's <laughs> really good. Uh, actually, can I can I throw one more in there? It's made by the same people who made Control, but Alan Wake. I've been playing that recently, and Alan Wake also is set on a sort of coastal town where there's a lot of people around, but there you, there's a mystery that you're trying to solve, and it's kind of psychological. Um, that game to me also kind of uh, sort of has those same themes running throughout it. I think of of loneliness and isolation. For sure. Maybe those games will tide you over wow. until these games release. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. That's good. <laughs>